Hi, and welcome to the Hollywood Dream Maker Podcast. I'm your host, Billy Gallo. I'm a 35-year veteran actor. I'm the kid who came out to Hollywood with 200 bucks in my pocket and a one-way ticket when I was 18. Didn't know a soul out here, and I've been living my dream ever since. I've had an amazing career. I've been an Academy Award-winning film, blockbuster film, hit TV series. You name it, I've done it, and I got the IMDb credits to prove it. Six years ago, I opened up my own school, the Manhattan Actor Studio, where I found my true passion. That's teaching the craft of acting, but not only teaching the craft of being the guy. Success leaves clues. I know how to make dreams a reality. I did it for myself, and I do it on a daily basis for my students. And I can help you achieve yours. Welcome to my podcast. Let's get started. I am super excited to introduce my guest. He's the founding member and present artistic director of the American Latino Theater. He's produced and directed an array of plays, poetry slams, television pilots, radio shows, documentaries, and animated series, and feature-length motion pictures. One of them is a film that I star in opposite Danny Trejo called Strike First Strike or Strike One. What's it called? First Strike? Yeah. First Strike, yeah. Uh, we changed the title on that. I want to welcome the very talented David Meiselman to the podcast. Welcome to the show, brother. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It it's great. good to see you. It's been a minute. I know. It's been a while. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to remember the last time we saw each other. It's got to be, you know, years ago because... Okay. Yeah, well, the last time I saw you was a few nights ago on screen and you were an angry police officer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I was an angry police officer in, in First Strike. Yeah. So, you know, I created this podcast to inspire other artists to follow their dreams, right? If a kid like me can come out to Hollywood at 18 with 200 bucks in my pocket, a one-way ticket, didn't know a soul out here and make the dream a reality, then why can't the listener out there? A, a guy like you come from Chicago. You came from Chicago, right? Yes. And, and to, to be in this show business and, you know, you've directed big movies with, you know, big name actors. You've done all of this amazing stuff. So I just want to go to the beginning. Like, when did you know you wanted to be in show business? Wow. Um, it, it kind of runs in the family. My mother was a jazz singer in Chicago and my parents, my dad ran clubs, nightclubs, and he was a writer. And uh, so kind of lived that kind of gypsy, artsy, fartsy kind of life as a kid. And um, and then I took off from New York when I was 18 and wanted to do theater out there. And of course, New York in 1981 was a very different place. So <laughs> I kind of um, I it was interesting. I kind of got caught really overwhelmed because New York is just such a big I being a kid from Chicago. I thought I had it made. And I realized I was really overwhelmed. And also, I really always wanted to come to L.A. more than anything else, ever since I was a little kid. So I, I came out here in the 80s and uh, and just made my way. I just started doing a lot of theater, um, mostly, and, and, and started out acting. And then through that process, realized what I really, really wanted to do was direct. But I didn't know how. I mean, how do you go from directing i mean from acting into directing so i started to learn how to direct theater but how do you transition into film and that was an interesting process and, and the first project i did was in the late late 90s did a horror project that has never been seen <laughs> kind of like trial and error so we uh took other people's money and kind of made a blair witch type project film called la river stories and uh learning on the job you know and and I would tell anybody, it's it's like what you just said. You come here with $200 in your pocket. You just, you try to find your way by finding the right people and the right things. And you just do it. You just get out of your own way and just do it. I mean, I, I don't know any other way to explain it. I mean, I didn't go to film school. You know, I went to college, but, you know, many colleges before I even got a degree and it was in fine arts, which I, I really kind of don't really apply it to what I'm doing now too much. It mostly... Um, I would say, oh, and mentoring. I mean, getting people, finding people in your life that are older than you, that you can, uh, that inspire you. And then work with them, you know, volunteer your time, work for free, learn, suck as much knowledge as you can. And I've had several people over the years that were that for me. Um, so you get to the point where you just kind of fall in, you find your own place in, in life in all of this and don't quit. I mean, I mean, that's, that's really the, the thing. I, I love... 
Every single person I heard, I just heard Leslie Jones this morning tell somebody on the show that she's doing on Comedy Central about, did she ever think of anything other than doing comedy? And she said, no. She said, the only person that gets in your way is yourself. That's it. So, and that's the truth. You know, if you really want something, do it. You know, and I, my advice today for a young person is um, there are tons of wealth here in town in Los Angeles of workshops, acting classes. I mean, look, you you teach uh, going to the actor studio, you know, where you're at people like myself. I mean, I, I, there's a uh, writing workshop that I uh, do scholarships for younger people uh, called page crafting people that want to write. Um, I mean, now you can virtually just take your iPhone and, and create your little own short film and put it there online and run it through the film festivals, virtually nothing. And, uh, and you just keep doing it and doing it and doing it and do it. And you know what? You get better. You get good at it, you know, through time. I think that's, that's kind of it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great advice. Great, great advice. You know, I tell my actors all the time, you know, they, you know, when we got into the business, you know, in the early eighties, whatever, you know, it was just a different time. You know, you, you actually had to actually book something to get some footage of yourself, you know, but now there's no excuses. They have a little movie studio in their back pocket. I mean, they literally, you know, write a script, shoot it, edit it, everything there, you know, have their own TV station on YouTube or, you know, Vimeo, what, you know, it's, there's zero, no excuses. It's all there for them. Yeah. And, and you're right. And I, and even now, I mean, the other thing is I'm learning from younger people. This, I mean, because a lot of the technology is just, it's recent. It's only over the last 10 years and True. it's continually, it's, it's continuing to evolve. I mean, the film that you and I did more than a little more than 10 years ago, that whole way of how films got distributed and put out there is totally different. So it was like more traditional style, you know, a company picked it up and then they put it on the stations and now, then they began to stream it. And then what I began to notice recently was it just kind of disappeared into the background. So I resurrected it, I pulled it out and repackaged it and put it on Instagram and all these different things, all these different social media and put a little, just a little money behind it. And all of a sudden I got a whole brand new audience. I got a bunch of kids in their early twenties now that have never seen this film. They love Danny Trejo and they love you and they love this film, you know? And I was like, wow. I mean, it's, it, it, it's great. I mean, it's like we, you know, I I looked at it and I got inspired by that, and I started doing um, short films again. So I did a horror a horror film um, that's out right now called The Tunnel, and and now I'm about to do another one. It, you know, it's just it just I, keep going. I I've got a question. So you mentioned in the beginning that your first horror film was something about the LA River, and now this picture that you short that you produce, you know, in 2023, uh, are they similar or is there something the seed that was planted back then that now it's coming to fruition? Yeah, this is kind of uh, based on that. Okay. <laughs> so the idea was I was always fascinated by why the LA river is dredged and giant cement concrete, kind of a concrete thing with all these tunnels. So I started investigating it, and of course I found out that it had been done almost 100 years ago, and over time it evolved. And it uh, those tunnels have been used for movies like them. I don't know if you remember that with the ants, mm -hmm. um, where these ants were giant size, and they would grab people and take them into their colony in these tunnels. So I think that's the last time I ever saw anybody do a horror film with it. So the idea was to have these creatures that live in the tunnel, and they come out and they grab people and eat them. And we did this over 20 years ago and it was, it was a flop. I mean, we really did such a bad job with it. We didn't know what we were doing, you know, and, and we didn't have a script, but the thing was we went out there and we just did it. We shot it. We were with a group of friends and that idea kind of stuck in my mind. And so we actually wrote a feature version of that, you know, way different. And it's been sitting around for about five, six years. And then I decided, you know, let's do a spinoff. Let's do a short of this. So we shot it and then put it out in the film festival circuit and we made it into 33 festivals and won like 37 awards. That's amazing. And we're at the Culver City Film Festival on December 5th. It's screening at the Cinemark and it's doing exceptionally well. And again, there you go. I mean, you just don't know unless you're out there doing it. There's really, like you said, no excuse. You can always write something. You can always shoot something. I mean, Look, all the more famous Hollywood writers that have done stuff, I, I would say maybe 5% or a little more of their materials actually got done. They have so many scripts and so many ideas and there's and a lot of stuff you work on and it just, you know, 
it just doesn't come to fruition, but it leads to something else. You know, it gives you an idea, hey, maybe I'll go in that direction. Or you go back to it some years later and do a rewrite and then it gets done. So, I mean, I, I just, um, it kind of like, I guess when you were saying back in the day, in the 80s, when you, um, when, if you were a film actor, you're only a film actor. Hmm. If you did commercials, you only did commercials. If you're a TV person, it was kind of taboo to cross over. You were looked down upon. If you were a, a movie star and you didn't do t not anymore. Everything is all over the place. Everybody's crossing over into all sorts of things. There's so much wealth of, of info. A lot of people are doing podcasts. I mean, look at you. I think this is the best time ever for Hollywood, the best time to come, the best time to be artistic and commercial at the same time. That's the other thing. There was this whole thing of, oh, I'm an artist. I don't do that. I'm, you're selling out if you do something commercial. It's bullshit. Yeah. I mean, sorry, you were cursing. But, you know, right. no, there, it's, everything is, everything leads to something. Everything is, um, what's his name? Um, uh, Michael Caine always said there's no small parts. Mm -hmm. you know, he did everything he was offered. And he's right. I mean, it, it's true with anything. You know, and I, and again, it just goes back to, you know, I did this thing so many years ago and now here I am doing this and who knows what will happen with that. I might get a feature done, on it, you know, which would be cool. And I get to kill a bunch of millennials and Gen Zers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, work leads to work. You know, it's, yeah. you know, I was, I was that actor, you know, I was, you know, a serious theater actor from New York, Lee Strasberg, actor studio came out. I don't do commercials. I don't do that stuff. You know, till I saw Robert Dernier on uh, American Express commercial, and I was like, wait a second, hold on. <laughs> and then I saw my friend buying a big house and I'm like, how is he buying this big house? And he had a bunch of national commercials running. And I'm like, what am I doing? I need to start doing the commercials. And once I got into that world, I mean, I made a lot of money and it was great. It was one day's work and I got residual income. I mean, it was just like, I, I did a, let's say a Snapple commercial that led to five Snapple commercials. I mean, there was, you know, I worked a day and I, I was able to take care of my son and not have to worry about, you know, how to pay the rent because of those commercials. Right. And, and those commercial directors now that I work with back then, they're directing huge feature films now. So, you know, that's the path for a lot of those directors is they do some music videos, they go to commercial land, but they always want to go to the, you know, film and television side. So if you work with them early on, you establish these relationships that, you know, when they're casting their big movie, they go, hey, I remember we did three commercials together, you know, so it's, it's, it's a great way to network and, you know, really be able to, you know, pay the bills. So I tell actors, you know, do it all, everything, you know, voiceover work, commercials, you know, theater, whatever is, you know, open every revenue stream possible. So you're not having to wait tables. Right. And get and, and keep yourself out there meeting people. I mean, you just you never know. I mean, I know so many <clears throat> actors like yourself who will work with younger directors that are just starting out, who've got a fresh new idea and go, hey, this is kind of cool. You know, where is this kid going to land? Where, what, what is this project? And always, you know, pushing and stretching yourself with ideas. I mean, I've I've gotten back into doing horror, which is my favorite. It's always been my favorite genre to watch, but I never I never saw myself directing it. I was always doing like social justice, you know, and the, and the only time I, I toyed with horror was 20 something years ago. And I didn't do well with it. And now I'm looking at it and I'm going, hey, I, I, I've written four scripts now. And I'm like, I'm pretty good at this. This is it's actually a lot of fun. Um, and also it's, it's, it's a genre that is not that expensive to create mm -hmm. and the studios like it because the amount of money to make a horror film to then sell it is it, there. It's just, you know, it, you can spend $3 million on a horror film, which is a lot actually, and make a hundred million dollars. You know, that's one of the few genres that does that. You know, obviously, if you do an action film or you do sci-fi, you need special effects, you need a lot of stuff, car crashes, all that. And that, that gets a little pricey. But, you know, uh, horror is a, is a great, great genre. And a lot of people have been stepping into it lately. And, and it's fun. It's a really fun, fun thing, especially if you're young and you're starting out. I mean, you can do really cool, innovative stuff with your friends in a house, you know, a bunch of young people trapped in a house at night. Hello. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. It sounds <laughs> a little familiar. Of, yeah. I, I like you like that little film that you're talking about, about a bunch of kids trapped in a house on Halloween. You know, that night of the demons was the only horror picture I've ever done, but yeah. 
it's got such an, a huge fan base. So, you know, these horror conventions, I mean, I, every once in a while I go to them and it's, it's madness. So, you know, they, they, we just celebrated a 35th year anniversary for that film. Wow. So, you know, wow. but, but you're right. I mean, there is, the, it's got a huge, huge uh, market, you know, horror films. I mean, and, and they're, they're fun to make. I mean, I, I the, at, in my whole career, that's the most fun I ever had working, working on that movie is because, you know, it was playtime. It's hard, it was scary, you know, make yeah, that. Yeah. And, and, and they're also, you can be very creative. I mean, uh, what was the one that came out, The Quiet? I think it's called where they had to sign. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is, if you're going to do something horror, I mean, everything's been pretty much done. You know, there's always a demon, possession, uh, priest that goes after, you know, the devil, vampires, werewolves, all of that stuff. Ghosts, ghost stories are the best. But it's it's how you tell the story, you know, and, and what is it that you uh, how, why is your story different than from someone else's? And that's what I, I always look for, something that's unique. You know, like with the tunnel, it, the idea is having these creatures that no one's ever delved into, chupacabras. And and it's always been kind of a funny joke thing, the, a goat sucker, um, which is really how it started out in the 90s. But the idea was to take them and say they were genetically altered by the government and they're hiding. They got away and they're hiding in the tunnels and they're going after the homeless. So you start coming up with all of these ideas and you realize, hey, if I get three or four locations and I don't necessarily have to show them, I can show them grabbing somebody and then don't reveal the creature till the end. Mm -hmm. It's a very unique new way of scaring and giving people something else to fear at night when they go to bed. <laughs> That's cool. I mean, I, I've, you know, there's the legend of the chupacabra, you know, yeah. mi, mi, mi niños, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, it's great. That's awesome. I can't wait to see that. Yeah. It's, uh, um, the, uh, shorts out now, again, that's a spinoff of it. We're planning to do another short just for the heck of it in February, because this one did so well with another variation to it. Um, and make it even more scary than this one. And hopefully we'll do a whole series of little shorts and gain an audience from it, which I think would be kind of cool. So I've, this, I really like the short film format. Um, and I love anthologies, you know, like there's this series called Love and Robots, which is on, um, I think, Netflix or Amazon. No, it's Netflix. And it's animation from all over the world. But it reminds me of like the Twilight Zone. Everything has got some kind of strange twist or morality to it and they're they're anywhere from five minutes to 20 minutes long and that's neat because you get to see like 13 different things projects from filmmakers from all around the world and i think the short has come back um there's a lot mm -hmm. of um streaming services now that are just doing shorts which i think oh. is oh. yeah which is kind of neat well that that's what tiktok if you think about it, people are doing tiktok stuff and uh instagram those are basically little short vignettes you know comedy mostly or dance pieces and and that stuff is great you know, and, and it'd be nice to see more of that because then you can just sit down and watch something real quick and get it and be entertained. And then you don't have to sit for two hours or have to watch an entire series, which is fun, too. But, you know, that that that's the other thing I would advise. Start doing shorts first if you get into this, if you want to get into this business. And again, you can get your as an actor, you can get your friends together, use an iPhone and cut the thing on your own computer and put it out there. And you got it made. You can do dramas. You can do horror. Oh, nuts. You know, you can do some really, really cool stuff. I tell my actors all the time, create, 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 right? You know, use your resources. You know, you have, you know, I have the studio here and, you know, I've been here for nine years. My actors, you know, this is a safe place. They all, you know, grow and they, oh, I, I you know, I wrote the script and I, 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 I edit and I shoot and, you know, they, they collaborated and they created a short film. And I think it's playing at that same festival as you. It's called uh, The Ride. Mm -hmm. And it's cast like 20 something of my actors here at the Manhattan Actors Studio. And they just won Best Ensemble Cast in the short oh. film festival. So I'm like, that's that, you know, that's awesome. And it's just proof. Now they're walking red carpets. They're rubbing shoulders with other filmmakers. You know, right. it, you know, there's there, it's it's there's no excuse now. You have to create you have to create those short films and those short films. You know, now they did the short film and they learned from it and they made some mistakes and now they've grown as artists and now they're attempting the uh, feature, you know, they're right. sitting down and writing and collaborating and they, you know, they bring pages in and they work them. And I, I, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. It's about creating art. Right. That, that's, that, that's exactly what it is. And it, it, it's a process, you know, and, and I think the great thing about it is that, you know, as you get older too, you know, you go, I, I've gone through phases where I just like, kind of like, I don't want to do this or, this is a bummer and 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 you get 
there's always something that happens that re-sparks you, you know, and for me, um, you know, we had COVID and so I, I was kind of shut down for a couple of years like everybody else. And I just decided, you know what, I'm going to start writing. I'm going to, I'm going to, I joined this workshop and started writing. My favorite thing was on Sundays that you could read 10 pages of a group of people online on zoom, other writers and start reading our stuff. And I, that like the fire came back from just doing that, just being creative and not stopping, you know? And, and again, it goes back to, am I going to get in my own way and sit at home and mope and go, oh, man, I got nothing to do. With. And then the writer strike happened. Am I going to sit there and go, I don't want it. No, you know, it's like, okay, this is an opportunity to write and to come up with ideas and then call your friends and call, hey, man, I got this idea to do this short film, a horror film. Will you do the music? You know, I have friends that are musicians. And that, that's what I did with the tunnel, you know, called a really, two really good friends who are fabulous musicians and sound designers. And they did it for, you know, for nothing. They were bored <laughs> as well. And they needed to create something. And I said, look what we got. They looked at it and said, this is cool, man. I want to do the audio. Actually, um, in the tunnel, um, the guy did the sound design. He lives in Hawaii. His son, who was three at the time, could scream in two octaves at the same time. So he took his voice and then created the monster's, the creature's voice. Because he, he heard that sound from whales. And so, because you're in Hawaii, you hear a lot of whales and stuff. Yeah. He took it and he made it this kind of whale sound with it. Really creepy, original kind of sound. And that's that's the monster's uh, scream now. Their screeches as they come for the person. And I, I was like, that is really, really cool stuff. And that's what I love about this this part of um, as far as art is that you have to write, you have directors, the costume people, the makeup people, um, your 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 lighting, your, the art art direction, all these different people collaborating, and then your audio, you know, um, your music, and then all the sound design. It's such a it's such a great thing when you get a group of people together and you put something out there and it gets done. And you go, wow, because it's probably one of the few collaborative art forms that's out there. I mean, you know, most of the time, if you write a book, you write a book. You know, um, and, and performing too, you know, the actors come in and have got all this stuff to do with all these different people. Um, and one of the things I like to do also for me is on the set, I play the music to creep the actors out, mm -hmm. to set the tone. So I had some of the music done in advance, which was kind of cool. We played it on the set and they were just like, wow, is this in the movie? I go, yeah, <laughs> it's really creepy. <laughs> so yeah, that stuff is a lot of fun to do. So again, you know, you know, just don't stop. Just do your thing. You know? Love that. I mean, listen, during the whole pandemic, I created this podcast. You know, I was like, yeah. well, my doors are closed. What am I going to do? How do I share, you know, my voice with the world? So I created this podcast. I'm now, this is episode 94, you wow. know, so, yeah. you know, there's been a lot of, it's been years of hard work to put this out there, but, you know, it's really about leaving this for the next group of artists coming up where they stumble across this and they go, wow, this is a wealth of information. You know, it's a gold mine. It just, uh, I, I think that's, that's the other thing too, is, you know, people like yourself, and there's been so many other people now that are starting to give back and opening their doors because you know, the thing is, you know, the expression, you can't take it with you. You mm -hmm. can't take your knowledge and you can't take your money with you. So at when do you, you know, it's not just about creating legacy, but it's also passing on this wealth of information to the next people who want to pursue this and continue it and grow and make it better. And I, I honestly, you know, I hear, I, I hear a lot of, I mean, we can go down a negative path if you want down that rabbit hole. But I honestly feel right now it's better now than it's been since I started out in the sense of opportunities for young people and the and the stuff that I'm seeing coming out. I think a lot of the material coming out is fantastic. I've never seen so many shows in my life on television, so many original ideas, you mm -hmm. know, different and all anything you can imagine. Your dramas and dramas that are mixed with with science fiction and some of them are mixed with comedy and and and, and then limited series and and mysteries and you can just go on and on and on and, and a lot of the kids stuff is phenomenal too stuff for children you know that's a great uh family making family pictures which is something i'm working on right now working on a script for kids you know on a, on a movie for that has stars 12 year olds with monsters <laughs> in it it's a Ooh. it's a horror comedy with kids kind of like goonies meets you know, uh, Lost Boys, you know, so oh, love it. and that's I'm having so much fun. I've never you have to get in the minds of 12 year olds and bicker. And, and it's not hard to do. You just go back to fifth grade and go, OK, what was I? How would I say that? You know, how would a 12 year old react to another 12 year old in a situation compared to yeah. adults? 
that. So yeah, it's right. kind of fun. So there, you know, when I came out here, there was three networks. There was ABC, NBC, and CBS. Right. And HBO was just coming, you know, fledging new, you know, network, you know. Um, and I helped start the Fox network with my television show because there yeah. was, no, you know, there was no Fox network. But now there's everything. I mean, I, I you know, it's crazy how much stuff out there. And, you know, actors really, they, they have an opportunity now because, because of the pandemic, you know, now casting directors are more likely to see an actor that they've never, you know, instead of bringing me into the room back in the day in front of producers, you know, I don't know you, you may, you know, make me look bad. So I'm not going to bring you in, but now they have you self tape. So I'm willing to take a look at it, you know, so now it really doesn't even matter where you live. You don't even have to live in LA. I mean, you could be in wherever Texas and shoot a self tape and, and get it to a director. And if, if it's there, the performance is there. And I go, Oh my gosh, that's the guy I want to want to hire him. Yeah, you know, exactly. but back in the day, that kid would never got a shot. No, no. And, and, and you'd be lost. I mean, I remember the photographs, <clears throat> you know, there was a headshot and then you had to call the person in. And I can't imagine being a casting director. Cause I, I mean, I've cast the first time I cast something was in the nineties where working as an associate producer on someone else's film. And so I got stuck with the casting directors and I literally stuck. It was like four days of auditions all day long. And I, I could see how, you know, and the, even if you were talented and good and nobody knew who you were, you came in on the third or fourth day and all these people here watching, they're exhausted. They're tired. They're burned out. They're like, oh, my God, here we go. You know, kind of thing, as opposed to now there's stuff you can see. And if it's curated and it comes in, you can watch stuff very quickly at your leisure, you know, and say, hey, have you seen this kid? Look at this tape. This is amazing. You know, and you've got to you know, you don't have somebody who worked an eight hour day sitting at a table watching one person after the next person, you know, as opposed to, hey, I've got time to go through all this stuff. And it's the same thing with the film festivals. You know, um, I just heard a story, two really, really famous um, writers for horror uh, went to the Pepperdine Film Festival about four years ago and saw the shorts and saw this one short and they flipped and went to the, the two writer directors, students, and asked them, hey, do you have a do you have a script? Uh, and they said, no. How would you? We'll we'll work with you. And they did thirty versions of it, and then they made a uh, feature, and it went all the way, and it was, became a studio film. Now these guys are working; they're working directors. They're three pictures in, and it's a great. It's one of those stories where they said, had we not gone to that festival and seen this work, you know, because be, in years before there was no access to any of this stuff, and now stuff is streaming. So there is an opportunity. These guys would have never been discovered. I mean, that's my whole point. And yeah. so, I mean, you don't know unless you're out, you got to put it out there, but also there's again, more opportunity now for that to actually happen. And in our day, there really, really wasn't. You had to really f put your foot like a doors, like a, uh, a vacuum salesman. You put your foot in the door, you know, yeah. they close it and get, let me in. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I used to kick down the door. I'd sneak yeah. in through the window. You know, I mean, I mean, I remember I used to go to like, when I first came out I went to Warner brothers a lot and the guard at the gate said, sorry, kid, you can't come in. And I said, oh, okay. And I went around the building. I climbed the wall. I jumped onto the lot. And I jumped onto the set of Quicksilver with uh, Paul Rodriguez and Rudy Ramos and Kevin Bacon. And uh -huh. they didn't know I just jumped a lot. And I walked right out. They were filming. And they go, cut, cut. What's this guy doing? So I'm an actor from New York. And they didn't know I just jumped a lot. So they invited me. I sat on the set. I met all the actors. It was awesome. You know, but yeah. I mean, you got to have that kind of grit that kind of determination like i'm gonna go get this and you're not gonna i'm not gonna take no for an answer right right and I, I think you can still have that you still have to have that but you don't have to jump over a wall no but now you don't have to you have social media you have your phone you have yeah. you know you can create your own what i mean it's it's a completely different time i'm not i'm not advising for anybody to jump a lot <laughs> now you get arrested but you know it was it's that kind of hunger and determination that i'm going to go after this and nobody's going to stop me i'm going to get no's cool get some no's i believe every no brings you closer to a yes go get as many no's as possible yeah you know i love no's cool next you keep moving because one of them the next one's going to be a yes yeah exactly Hey, can we talk about casting a little bit? You know, like you were saying, you were in, in casting. You know, what do you look for uh, with actors in casting? All right. Well, I will give you I'll give you a great example. When you came and auditioned for us, you came in character. 
you dressed as Sergeant Veritas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, we were like, who is this guy? I mean, he just like nailed it. We're like, that's our guy. I mean, it was just casting someone that's prepared, obviously someone who's read the script. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're getting sides and stuff, try to get off book, you know, try to prepare as much, try to create your own backstory of this person. It, it, it really shows. It shows that you care. It shows you a respect for your craft and also for the people in the room, you know, and I, and I, I, I can't I can't emphasize that more than anything else is uh, being prepared. And I've worked with people who were friends on projects that have had the material for months and came in not prepared. And I go, dude, what are you doing? Isn't that even me? What about you? you got to have pride for yourself. And, and I think that's the key to all of it is, is preparation and also watching other people who are similar to you. And steal from them because that's what we all do. Mm-hmm. Humans are mimics. So I mean, when you write and direct and everything, you go, "Oh, I like that. I'm going to take that idea." You know, mm-hmm. um, the end of our horror film, I stole a line from uh, Red October, where the where the Russian submarine, where the the captain was so arrogant going after Sean Connery that he fired his his things too quickly, and they came back, and he says, "You effing idiot! You just killed us all." which is a line I use a Russian woman uses at the end of our thing. I said, such a great line to end the end of the film. You know, you, that was it. He said, you arrogant bastard, you just killed us all, you know, which is such a great line. But again, you know, like anything else, going back to the casting thing and say actors, I think what we look for is obviously if you're the right type for the part, the right, you know, but also that the person brings something to it. You know, even if even if you don't know, if you can make something up in your head as to, you know, give them a background story, the way you walk in, the way you present it, it makes it makes a big difference. It really, really does. I mean, and even when I think about it, even the smaller parts, you know, there are characters in films that have that one central line and they're not the star, but that's the central theme or central line. And it's unforgettable in the film. If you nail that and get that part, you're going to be remembered forever from that film. You know, somebody, you know, is going to see that. Did you ever see such a, you remember that guy who said blah, blah, blah. Oh, where is he? You know, and you'll get recast for something else. Yeah. That's another thing too. People look for, again, get in as many short films as you can. Get into as many low budget. Um, if you're starting out, you know, student films, all the student films being made at UCLA and USC and, and you, you get into them, do them, do them. Yeah. You, know, you don't know who's going to see them at what festival. They go, did you see that actor in that? That film called um, The Dark? No. What? Oh, phenomenal. He had this scene where he's running and then he gets the arrow on the back and he does this speech. And I'm making this up, but I mean, it's just, you know, you remember that if you're if you're a casting director, director, producer, if you see something and, you know, we do that a lot, too. But if you're if you're just breaking in, you know, if you're going to those auditions, make yourself memorable. You know, and I think that's the key. Um, all the people that auditioned for the film that we did, every single person was memorable in their auditions, every single last one. Can we talk about, about my audition for a second? Because I know, yeah. I remember that you had done the film as a short film, and right. and, and the guy who played Sergeant Veritas, I mean, like he was like to play it in the feature film, if I believe. Right, right. And he, wanted, he was, he's my friend, and he was one of the producers for the film. And... Um, but what made you change your mind is the question. He wasn't, we realized, you know, if you're going to be honest to the parts, to the roles, he wasn't right for that character who Veritas needed to be. Age-wise, voice-wise, just all of the energy. And we needed somebody who could match Trejo. He had to match Danny Trejo, well, pound for pound. It didn't, I wouldn't believe, if I put, I know nothing against, I mean, he's a fabulous actor and he's a great guy. But I mean, <laughs> you know, it, Trey will eat him up. Just presence and energy, yeah. and, and yeah. you know, and, and you have all of that. You had all of the edge and everything, and you also came in as the character. We we're like, that's him. That's the guy. That's what we want. Yeah. And it was written that way. So you know, we that that's another thing. Don't settle. Um, and this is a big mistake a lot of young early filmmakers do is they put their friends in everything, and they're not necessarily the right person for the part. Yeah. For the film because it, it actually hurts the film and it doesn't it's again it's a collaborative art form so i mean i don't know how many times you've seen where some rich guy puts his girlfriend and wife in and she's just not right for the role you sure. know been she's there just, you know, <laughs> even if she's a decent actress 
Um, Indiana Jones, you know, what's her name was in it. Um, Spielberg's wife. She was not right for the part, but she was very good in, in uh, Black Rain with with Michael Douglas. She was fine in that, but she wasn't good in Indiana Jones. And I was like, why is she in this? It should be a different actress, you know. But, you know, again, um, and we did that. You know, we didn't want to sacrifice this film for, a, you know, for a friend, you know. So we gave him the other part. <laughs> and which was which was a part really hard for me as an actor because I know I, I kind of like took his part and and you made him my partner. So in every scene he was on over my right hand shoulder, I felt his eyeball burning a though. hole in my head. <laughs> know, but it still it looked good because yeah. now he was his big stern yeah. presence. Yeah, no, you know, no, he's absolutely. a big guy. So it was kind of like now it works. Well, I'll tell, I'm gonna tell you better than him. Oh yeah, it worked. I'm going to tell you a funny story. I don't know if I ever told you this, but um, I don't know, prior, yeah, maybe like a year prior to making the film uh, with Danny, um, I was at a pizzeria in the Valley and I saw Danny Trejo and I was eating my pizza and I said, oh my gosh, that's Danny Trejo. You know, I was a little starstruck, you know, this, you know, machete. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so I walk over to him and I introduce myself. I said, hey, Danny, my name is Billy Gallo. I'm an actor, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy your work. And, you know, one of these days we're going to work together. And he kind of looked at me like, OK, whatever, you know, kind of like, you know, whatever. So I went wow. back to eat, eating my pizza, you know, uh -huh. you know, he was gracious. He took a picture with me. So me and we took a picture together, you know, uh, shook his hand. And I said, you know, one of these days we're going to work together. So now I get cast in the film and I go to the table reading and I sit down in my chair and right across from me is Danny Trejo. So, so I said, remember me? <laughs> and he was like, I go, I met you in a pizzeria about a year ago. And I told you we'd be working together. Here we are. That's the last thing I said to him. Wow. You know why? Why? Because my character f hated him. Oh, I wanted, yeah. I wanted him dead. And I'm a method <laughs> actor. So I'm not going to sit around and being chummy, chummy, eating a donut with you at craft services. I just, I was, I was burning, like, I would look at him from across the room with evil eyes the whole movie. <laughs> People would tell him, who is this guy? Because the whole time, I did not say a word to him, a peep to him. That's and, when, I, and I remember when we got, we got into that, uh, the scene in the bar, and I come up to him, and, and, I, and I'm eyeball to eyeball, and I'm staring at Big Bad Machete, but, you know, my character just wants to chew him up and spit him out. And I look at Danny in the eyes and, and my line was, what's the matter, Hollywood? Will you, what's the script say? Or you can't remember your lines or something like that. Yeah, yeah. He looked at me like a deer in the headlights and he couldn't remember <laughs> his line. And I was like, oh, I got him. I'm in his head. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, was, I, was, I, was, I was up in his grill and it was fun to be able to, you know, he's the big bad Danny Trejo, but I got to be, you know, the big bad Sergeant Veritas. <laughs> exactly. Well, that, yeah. and that's what was needed for, for that and for that part. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, you know, and, ca and casting is so important. That's why. And, you know, I hear a lot of the people like us who are behind the camera, the writers, the directors and stuff. And they 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 I love when people go, oh, you know, actors are kind of overrated and prima donna and this, this and that. And I said, the actor is everything at the end of the day. If they're not conveying across that screen for this. And like I said, you know, you might have a very talented actor, but if they were not cast properly for that role and they're not conveying it you're going to lose your film if it's just not going to happen you know and 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 that that is it, it's such an important element as to what makes a film and that's why you know the actors do get the accolades and they and they are getting the most attention and everything because of that i mean again it is a collaborative process everything's important but if you don't have the right person conveying that those lines, conveying that information, sure. all that scene is being paced out. You're done. You're done. And the film is done. I have seen so many films that were well-written, well-directed, and one person blew it in that film. Tarantino did it to himself. What was the film he did where he played the husband? Reservoir Dogs? No, no, no. Uh, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Pulp oh, yeah. Fiction. I hated that scene. You know, it was like, dude, you're 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 weak, and that's it. He got better, <laughs> but he put himself in that scene. I'm going, oh. So everybody kind of like, you know, everybody just kind of like, well, you know, it's it's campy and this is yeah. now. Still, I was like, ah, oh, you took away from your own movie. Don't cast yourself, you know, in that. He, he was wrong for that part, you know. So, yeah. but uh, again, it's just uh, it, 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 casting and. and 
I, I look at all of this and I go, you know, if you're going to do that's the, that's what I was going to say was if you're young and you're listening to this and you want to do your own thing with your friends, make sure you write something or do something that's in your wheelhouse. Don't sit there and say, OK, we're going to do our interpretation of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Uh, no, <laughs> you're not with British accents and stuff. You are now if you're going to do your own, you know, hip hop version and you're from the streets or whatever. OK, that's cool. And you update the language and make it your own script. That's something else. But, uh, you know, <laughs> or we're going to reenact, you know, um, Dunkirk, you know, whatever. It's just like, no, no, no. So. Can we talk about that? The hip hop version, the streets. I mean, I know you're, uh, you know, involved with the Latino theater, the American Latino theater. You know, how'd you get involved with that? Um, been doing that, God, probably, but I've been involved in theater in LA since I got here. And I, again, I started out as an actor. I did theater 64, 70, you know, on the complex, which is on Santa Monica Boulevard. I did a shitload of plays there. And that was my own place. I think everybody's gone through the complex. And in fact, I knew the owner very well. He was a very good friend of my uncle, who was an actor back in the 60s, an old hippie. Um, so I kind of went through the rounds and met a lot of people in the industry that have gone on to be stars or writers and, and, and a lot of us that have gone home as well. I mean, it's, it's interesting over the years, but it was a great starting place uh, for me. And so I began to get involved with other Latino actors and got hooked up with an organization called Nosotros, which I don't think even exists now, but it was started by Ricardo Montalban back in the 70s. Right, I remember and something to, and they had an award for Latinos and recognition and uh, actually Sinatra supported them in the early days financially and helped Ricardo out. Wow. They eventually got the theater, the Ricardo Montalban Theater, which used to be the Vine Street Theater. I, re I remember it. The High Street Theater, which is still there now. Mm -hmm. And we got in there we um, with Nosotros. We were housed there. And I said, let's start our own repertory theater. We'll call it Ricardo Montalban Repertory Theater. So we did a whole series of plays, got great reviews. I ran it as a theater tech as well, so that we had our resident theater and then other companies would come in and we'd do their shows. And then by... 2009, they got bigger and got involved with Nike and they wanted to do more like commercial type projects. So we became the American Latino Theater and then moved into Boyle Heights and started collaborating with the folks there. Um, Casa 101, mm -hmm. which is uh, Josefina Lopez's um, company that she started. She, she wrote uh, Real Women Have Curves, which was a movie on HBO. America mm -hmm. came out of there. I mean, a lot of a lot of Latinos came came through that theater company. Didn't you discover uh, Johnny from the yeah. film? There? Yeah. Uh, so John, there were several actors. Actually, we even got Zahn, who's gone on to have a fantastic career through them. Yeah. Um, he was recommended to us through uh, Ed Edward Padilla, who's still with Casa 101. So he's kind of got his thumb on the pulse as far as all the Latino talent that's in East Los Angeles and in L.A., a lot of young talent. Well, they had a program that was youth at risk. And so what we wanted to do was in front of the camera, behind the camera, which we did in the theater, did a lot of youth at risk in the theater, in the, in our plays, usually had ensemble cast and then lighting and, you know, to teach them. And so our camera crew got to our makeup department and then Johnny and the three other boys that remember the other boys that were with him. Sure. Yeah. They also were part of that Casa 101 and they were youth at risk and they came into the program. They were fantastic. You know, and it did really great things for all of them. I yeah, think. And Johnny was great in the film, uh, you know, for yeah. his first film. He was really he did an amazing job. Yeah, he did. He really did a good job. And, he, and, you know, he went on to do American Crime on ABC and Soy Negro and some other projects. So, yeah, it's uh, it was a great starter point for several people. We've had two of our character uh, characters, two of our kids. I cannot remember their names. Uh, we're in the early 20s in the electrical camera department are working on shows right now. And in, in they're they're in their thirties. Yeah. Um, they went on to do their union. I mean, they went in and got careers. So I, I'm really proud of the fact that that mm -hmm. film launched so many young people. Um, I just wish I could have done more of those types of projects um, after mm -hmm. that. It was really again difficult at that time to get those types of projects off the ground. So yeah. So now we're back. 
Yeah. You know? So so for those young Latino actors out there who are listening to this, they want to get involved with, you know, some of these, you know, American Latino theater, you know, find your tribe of actors and, you know, let them know you're there because a casting director, you know, will take notice and know, OK, hey, look, who's this new guy? You know, look yeah. what he's doing on stage. And it will tell a director who's doing a short or a, a feature film and say, hey, I, I just met this kid in the theater, man. You have to see him. You know, so that's, you know, that's how you get your foot in the door. So, you know, you want to pay your dues. You want to go to work. You want to do that theater. You know, you said you didn't go to film school, but you did your film school. You went out and you made that short, you know, horror project and you made a lot of mistakes along the way, but you learned. It was yeah. on the job training. Yeah, you know, exactly. th and that's what, you know, those actors out listening have to do is, is they have to do that, you know, on the job training, you learn and you grow and you make some mistakes and you continue to do and you do it again and do it again, do it again until, until, you know, one day, one of the, these films, you know, hit and people just go, wow, well, this film's amazing. Yeah. And it's, and it's a continual process. I mean, the other thing I, I realized, you know, my career has been all over the place and I, and I've, and I've had a good life. I mean, it's been great, but I'm still a student. I'm still learning. I mean, there's so much stuff I'm. I'm learning how to market stuff on social media. Um, I'm learning the festival circuit that I didn't know. I, I, so example, when we started with uh, First Strike and we got into the Cannes Film Festival, we went there with California Pictures. And yeah, I remember. So they took us there and big party and we were in twin uh, the Twin uh, Cities Festival and that was hot and we went to New York City that we were in that big festival and that was it. It just went dead. And we had submitted to like 60 festivals. We thought we were it. We ended up only getting in five. But again, there wasn't social media like there is now. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was kind of a, a humbling experience um, in that sense. Now with this particular project, what, I've, what I'm learning is, again, I got a horror project. I'm not going to submit my film to everything. I'm not going to submit it to Sundance. I'm not going to submit it to the big ones. They get 12,000 12, submissions. Now I'm going to go to all the horror festivals. You know, even the bigger ones, but horror, that's my genre, or thriller or crime, you know, my niche. I'm not going to submit it to the uh, All Women's Festival UK, <laughs> you know, or the LGBTQ Festival, unless my characters were gay, you know, or trans or whatever. But that's not that's not my that's not our niches or so that's the other thing is there are all these niches now and there's so many ways to market your small little project for virtually nothing. The other thing I learned, too, is that you don't pay a lot of money to get into festivals, you know? And if somebody invites you to a festival and they want your film, they have to pay you. That's how it works. It's not the other way around. So there's a, there's a lot of education, I would call, as to how this whole thing works. And like I said, I'm a student now, I'm learning all of this, going through this. I actually signed up for a workshop with a guy named John Fitzgerald, who started slam dance and he's got several books out and I went and got consultation from him. Hey, how do you do this? I just yeah. took it and threw it on the wall. That's not how you do it. <laughs> you know, let's see if it stuck. And some of it did, some of it didn't. We got lucky. We got really, really lucky. But you know, I got to the point now where I said, I'm six months in this run. And I said to this guy, I said, I honestly don't know what I'm doing when it comes to the festival. Can you teach me? And he says, well, here's some resources. And he guided me and I started reading his books and Next thing you know, I'm going, oh, 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 okay. So this is how it's done, you know. That's awesome. Yeah, and um, and now I know what I want to do. I want to do a short, a sequel to this short, and I know how uh, I learned that six to eleven minutes is the programming for shorts for festivals. I have a twenty-four minute short. It's good, but it, in a lot of cases, they might not be able to program it. The other thing was to contact the programmers at the festivals directly. Write a cover letter to them. Make yourself stick out. You know, jump over the wall at Warner Brothers and go, hey, I'm here from New York. I'm an actor. It's the same thing. Yeah, Don't is. get in your own way, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, get out there and do it. Yeah. It's great advice. And learn and learn and learn. Listen, I, I've been I've been doing this for a long, long time. I mean, I've been in, came out to Hollywood. I got my set card in 1985. Wow. So <laughs> I... I you know, I came out at 18. I, you know, I booked my first job. I guess on a fall guy. I got my, my SAG card, you know, and the rest is history. But, you know, I've been doing this a long time. But, I, you know, I've had my school here for nine years now. I mean, you remember when I opened it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Was opening in the studio and we were here in the beginning. But, you mm -hmm. know, nine, nine years. But I learned something every day. Yeah. Every day I learned something from my actors. I love directing. I love to play with actors and get them where they got to go. 
You know, and you're right. Every every day, every time you walk out the door, it's it's a it's a class on acting and directing and everything. Everything you see, you want to become aware and you want to open up all your senses and look how that person walks or look at that hat and that wardrobe or listen to that accent or whatever. You know, it's all gold for your actor toolbox or your director toolbox. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and it, and it gives you inspiration as to you know characters also for writing. You know, sure. one of the things they don't you know I learned. When I sit, you know, like sometimes I'll take something and I'll go, all right, I'm having problems with this character. It's flat in the scene. I go, well, who would I cast? Who would be this guy? Okay, Billy Gallo. Billy Gallo is this dude. Now, what would he say and do in this situation? And what would he do if he played this character from this film and yada, yada, yada? And all of a sudden you're going click, 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 click. Aha, aha. And then all the lines just start coming out. And you go, now I've got, I've actually got a character. As opposed to this guy is a general in this scene, and I got no backstory, and he's an asshole. That's not enough. That's 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 just too simplistic. This guy, you know, worked his way up from Brooklyn and got into the academy and became an officer and fought in this war. And he was not from the pedigree. He came from Brooklyn. Yada yada yada. And now he's a general. And this guy had to bust his way up there. There's a reason why he's a hard ass in a certain way because of his life, this background story. And this is the way he would say these things and yada, 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 you know, and that, and that for that, you know, for writers too, um, you know, when you're writing stuff for actors or, and, and for a, a film or a play, you want to place in your mind, who would you cast? Who would, who would you cast? Not necessarily. Now the director is going to come in and do whatever he wants, but that's a whole nother story. But I mean, you know, most of the people that I write now are people who I know, family members, a combination of people. Yeah. You know, the, the little girl that I'm writing this story, uh, Adventure, she's based on my wife. I'd imagine her as a child. Well, she was probably a little precocious 12 year old who knew, was a no, nosy little nobody, you know, like a Nancy Drew type. That's my wife. So I was like, okay, you know, and some elements of my daughter. So, you know, the, I mixed those characters to create, create this person. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, and again, you take from other projects, other films. I mean, you know, I, I can't also tell a young person, see as many films, go see live theater, go force yourself to get out there and, and listen to certain types, different music, stuff that's not in your wheelhouse. Start to enjoy, go to the opera once there, you can get mm. tickets for nothing. Just go down to an opera. You won't know what the fuck is going on. Yeah. Go down there and watch this thing and go, wow, this is amazing. Because this is early theater. This is early ballet. This is early music. Hundreds and hundreds of years before we even would attend anything like this. And go, how do these people do this? You know, and then you understand where the lighting, the costuming and, and certain things came from. You know, and then you have a, a more of a, a, a base and inspiration as to, hey, I got a foundation. Start building a foundation for yourself. You know, it's great advice. I, you know, I tell my actors all the time, go, you know, like if you like rap music, well, listen to some country Western or, you know, go to the museum, go yeah. look at art, look at the application of paint, look at go see Van Gogh or Mordigliani or Picasso, you know, like really like just keep loading yourself up, your, your actor toolbox, your life toolbox with all of this amazing stuff, because it's all going to be your paint later on when you're creating a character or writing a script or, you know, whatever you're doing that you can, you can use that as your paint. And it, and it's truth. It's not like you're make believing. It's your you know this is something real. It's coming from here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that and that's that. I think that's the uh, the best advice to give anyone. I think the one lucky thing I got from my parents was that you know my our, my parents really pushed us into listening to all kinds of music. I mean, I was a kid growing up in Chicago. I only wanted to listen to rock, so I was into Zeppelin and and. Uh, and all those bands from that Van Halen, I was totally into that was my thing at that time, even though I was a Puerto Rican kid, you know, I grew up in the Midwest. And my mom would like, how about you, why don't you try listening to some Miles Davis? Mm -hmm. You ever heard of Miles Davis? No. Oh. You know, or, or my dad would be like, listen to some Frank Sinatra. Oh, I don't want to listen to Frank. Listen to some Frank Sinatra. And then as time goes on, it begins to inspire you. And then you realize these rock musicians, where they got their stuff from. You find out they listen to these guys or Mozart or whoever, you know, and, and it's like you're talking about and, and Picasso. And I remember them dragging us to museums and I hated it. And now I go back and I look at it and I go, whoa, this gave me subconsciously inspiration as to how things are designed and why, you know, and how, and how these things influence you as an artist now. And what you can bring, like you said, you can go into that little toolbox and then pull it out, you know, for your creativity. 
great. I mean, it's, all, it's all just great. Love that. So final question. Mm. Okay. So if you could go back and give some life advice to the younger you, knowing what you know now, what would that be? Ooh. If I could go back and really give you, I would say really give yourself more credit. In other words, it's that get out of your way thing. I got in my way a lot. Um, partying, having fun. I, I, I don't regret joining the Navy because I was I went to the military for a while and that kind of straightened my shit out. But if I had to go back before that, I would tell myself to really like, you know, kid, um, you got all these things. In other words, focus on one thing and don't try to be, what's the expression? Jack of all trades, master of none. And so I spent a lot of time saying I was an actor and I was this and I was that, but I didn't do it, do the work. I was all over the place. I, that would be my advice. Like take, pick one thing and just stick with it for a number of years. So, you know, Love that. a lot of time. Do the work. Do the work. Do the work. Exactly. And never give up on your journey. <clears throat> yeah. Don't give up, which yeah. I did several times when I was younger in different ways. Yeah. So, it took, you know, it takes some of us, it takes longer to find your, your path. Sure. Um, I think it's different in our era, too, because you didn't have social media and we didn't have the same kind of exposure to stuff, you know, the way you do now. You were very focused. I mean, obviously, you had a dream. You knew what you wanted. Got your ass here and did it. Me at 18, <laughs> I was in New York pretending plain to be an actor and I was just fucking around getting into stupid trouble. But, you know, I, I think back on it and I go, hey, everything has a reason for where and how you evolve to certain things, you know. So, you know, it's been a long journey, but hey, it's paid off in the end. Yeah. Like you said, I, I got a nice home. I got a daughter who's doing really well. That's what it's, that's what's Very important. Long time, you know, yeah. so. So you I did you know what I found is that the secret to living mm. is giving. Yeah. Being of service. How can I make a difference in somebody else's life? That's why I have this school. That's why I have the podcast. It's like, it's before it used to be about me, ego, ego, you know, me, me, yeah. me, me. And, you know, that, that didn't fill me up. You know, I mean, when I had the fame and the TV show and the money and the thing, and it, there was still something missing in me, you know, like a hole and, and, you know, fame and all that stuff doesn't fill that hole. But what I truly found that is when I can be of service, when I can, you know, share my story right. and, and I can help somebody else, you know, put my hand on and go here, this is the way, here's the path. I've carved my way through Hollywood. I know how to get you where you want to go. I've made the mistakes. Don't make those mistakes. You know, this is what you, this is your path. I right. love the, being the guide, you know? Yeah, it, it, it actually, and you're actually guiding yourself at the same time. Absolutely. Like your own, you're, you're being your own parent at sure. the same time. It, yeah, you're right. Being of service. You know, and my wife says, why are you helping these kids? And why are you doing that? And I said, because it, it, it not only just makes me, it's not only is it the right thing to do, but it makes me feel good. It, like you said, it fills that hole. But it also kind of teaches me. I mean, it, it it keeps me level, you know, and inspire. It gives you the inspiration to want to do more. Like, I don't want to quit now. I What's retirement? Who retires? I'm going to go on a golf course and play golf and not write yeah. or make fun of this freaking way, you, man. You, your next project can make you an overnight success. You know, your very <laughs> next audition, you know, it's like, just don't give up. Just keep, keep at it, you know, and, yeah. and just, and keep going yeah. at it. It doesn't even matter. That's the other thing. People hit, hit the big time They hit the, the gold vein and then they quit. It's like, sure. no, take that and run even harder with a football, you yeah. know, Michael Jordan, you look at Michael Jordan. I, what I love about him with athletes that have all the talent and work hard, they continue to work hard and don't stop. You know, Kobe, same thing. He just, that guy just kept going and going. Tenacity. He didn't need to. He could quit and just live on his laurels. But why? Yeah. You know, if you're passionate and you love what you do, man, you just pop, 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 pop. That's the key. You just hit the nail on the head. You know, be passionate and love what you do. And, and be open and grow and learn and, you know, just never give up on your dream. Bring David. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to jump. I know it was last minute, jump on the podcast, sharing your wisdom and knowledge. I'm, I'm super grateful. I, I hope I, you know, inspire some folks. I, I hope it was. Absolutely. Really honored though. Thank you. Yeah. It's so, my, it's my honor. You. It's my pleasure. <laughs> and, I, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Yes. Yes, for sure. We definitely got to hang out. So. Oh.
All right. Take care, brother. All right. Take care. Peace. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. Please rate, review, share this with your friends. Subscribe if you haven't. Please take whatever you get from here, the golden nuggets, and apply them to your career. Go after your dreams with passion. Don't let anybody tell you it can't be done. I believe in you. Follow your dreams. I'll see you in Hollywood.